critiques in Ohio learning about the local economy. And while Salman Ahmed and Jake Sullivan will be the first to admit that their decision to visit Ohio in cold, icy February was spectacularly mistimed, <laughs> all of us have benefited enormously from their efforts and from the efforts of the entire task force, a number of whose members are with us today. Uh, working together, Republicans and Democrats, strategists and economists, they've provided the foreign policy community with critical ground truths as we begin to grapple with one of the most consequential challenges facing the United States today, forging a new compact that reinforces the connection between leadership abroad and rejuvenation at home. The 2016 presidential elections, as all of you know as well as I do, made vivid the yawning gap between the aspirations of many Americans and the consensus of the foreign policy elite. But the roots of this disconnect run much deeper and go back much farther. The last four administrations have all begun their terms with a sharp focus on nation building at home and a commitment to be rigorous and disciplined about overseas commitments. Yet each successive administration has had great difficulty marrying its words with its deeds, seemingly taking on more and more global responsibility with little obvious direct benefit at home. I remember all too well how in the Situation Room, when we were debating increasing troop levels or other investments of a billion here or a billion there, President Obama would stop and remind us, not so gently, that many of his domestic priorities were starving for another billion here or a billion there, and that unlike the rest of us around the table, he was elected to weigh those kind of trade-offs. Of course, it's one thing to acknowledge that advancing the well-being of the middle class will require rethinking American foreign policy. It's another thing entirely to translate this sentiment into new ideas and initiatives. And that is precisely why Carnegie brought this bipartisan task force together. Our aim is not to preach the Beltway gospel to the uninitiated. Instead, we want to listen to and work with a variety of voices from a number of states to understand what is actually driving their economic development and the impact that different foreign policy approaches might have on their economic well-being. Under the characteristically modest, imaginative, and thoughtful leadership of Salman Ahmed and through indispensable partnership with The Ohio State University, our task force members have produced an excellent first report. By reaching out to state and local officials, regional economic developers, small business owners, and local labor leaders, some of whom are with us today, they've made vivid how shallow and caricatured the political debate on this issue has become. Over the coming months, Salman and his colleagues will build on this case study with similar efforts in Colorado and Nebraska, refine further our understanding of this challenge, and then offer our best judgment and recommendations ahead of the 2020 election season. To help us navigate this tricky terrain, I'm very pleased and honored to introduce today's distinguished panel. I can't think of a better group to help us draw out and apply lessons from places like Ohio to policymaking in Washington. As White House Chiefs of Staff, always one of the hardest jobs in public service, and until recently at least, one of the most sought after, um, <laughs> Josh Bolton and Dennis McDonough dealt constantly um, with the infinitely complicated balancing act between foreign and domestic policy. I had the extraordinary good fortune of serving with both of them, and I have enormous respect for them and for their service. I have similar respect for Susan Glasser, who will moderate the conversation. Now a staff writer at The New Yorker, Susan is an elegant observer of both the complexities of American society and the rapidly changing world around us, from the harshness of Putin's Russia to the turbulence of Iraq and Afghanistan. As you can see, we have a lot of ground to cover this morning, but first, please join me in thanking Salman Ahmed, The Ohio State University, and our task force members for leading this critically important and timely endeavor, and please join me in welcoming our terrific panelists to Carnegie. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Bill, uh, and thank you to Carnegie for hosting us today. This is a, a terrific um, project, and I have to say, if you haven't had a chance to look at the report, um, it's really worthwhile, especially because I think it, it picks up where uh, some of us journalists maybe have, have left off and dives deep into some case studies in a way that, uh, you know, I was always looking for uh, 
this kind of work and didn't always find it. Uh, perhaps the 2016 election, we can look back on in hindsight and, as we said, uh, see this as one of the positive uh, unintended consequences. Uh, certainly for us in the foreign policy world, uh, I think this is a different kind of conversation than we're having than we would have had a couple years ago. And uh, I'm very grateful and, and here mostly because I'm interested to hear what, what Dennis and Josh can can tell us about this moment. As we pointed out, White House Chief of Staff is one of the only jobs in some ways in our government that marries the two subjects, uh, that you come together around the politics, the policy, the economic policy is very, very siloed from the foreign policy. Uh, but I know everybody here really wants to know the question, uh, so we'll just start out with that and then we can, we can jump back in. But, uh, there's a bake-off for your, your old jobs. It's being held in a reality TV sort of fashion. And I, I think we're all desperately looking for whatever navigation uh, you can provide us. John Kelly, uh, uh, who is leaving, except maybe he isn't leaving because there's no one to replace him, he has taken to saying that the White House Chief of Staff's role is the Chief of Staff, not the Chief of President, uh, which is his way of essentially throwing up his hands and saying, see, you know, it's not my job to manage <laughs> the guy. I gotta ask, you know, how, how true is that statement? Uh, and what navigation can, can each of you offer us in terms of, uh, is there a scenario you could envision uh, for a successful White House Chief of Staff in this, in this environment? Well, I, I guess I, I just want to go on the record here and say uh, I'm taking myself out of the running. <laughs> it's just been dogging me all week. And I just I thought this is one place I could just put it all to rest. So um, look, uh, I, I do think that the only scenario under which uh, uh, chief of staff can be successful with the president is if the president changes his conception of the, of the chief of staff's role. and. Um, that uh, I think is what John is referring to, John Kelly. Um, so without commenting on, on him or Reince or, or anything else, I will, I will just say that they have uh, a particularly, they have had a particularly hard job made even harder by virtue of the president, uh, not necessarily seeing his chief of staff as a partner uh, to him, as somebody who can help. <coughs> Uh, manage the, the flow of every day, who can help uh, take things off his agenda, make sure that they're placed on other people's agendas, and then also keep the whole enterprise focused on uh, a long-term strategy rather than a day-to-day -day fight. Um, it does seem to me that they've taken, uh, the, the President Trump in particular is focused in particular on every day as a new set of opportunities, a new set of rounds uh, in an ongoing fight. Uh, and it's then difficult to manage him and a team toward a uh, managed outcome on that. And it's not clear to me that everybody knows every day what they're supposed to be doing. You know, it's interesting. Often American presidents come, uh, you know, of whatever party, and certainly for their first couple years in office, they define themselves in opposition to what they came. I think this might be a very unusual situation where the, President Trump seems to be defining his White House in opposition to uh, how you ran the White House as opposed to the substance of it uh, as well. Uh, Dennis is famous for this expression, process protects you. Uh, so does that mean we're unprotected? It means that uh, it's hard to understand uh, how decisions are made, which means uh, it's hard to understand how the American people's interests are protected and whether there are other interests that are uh, given a preferential treatment or get biased access to decision making. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, that's what the White House promises the American people, which is a place where hard decisions get made transparently, consistent with laws uh, and practices around ethical treatment of questions. And when the American people lose confidence that there is a process protecting their interests in that way, um, I think there's uh, a major challenge to the, to the democracy. Um, and we've seen this at different times in our history, but uh, 
and reforms and changes come as a result. Um, but that's, that's my biggest concern. So Josh, are you also taking yourself out of the running? Are you still a contender? Um, I, uh, I happen to be in, uh, uh, out of town on Sunday when, when the Sunday shows were full of the, um, the turmoil about chief of staff and the White House now casting a broad net and so on. And I, um, I, I call, I, I went on FaceTime home to say goodnight to the kids and, and the, the face that appears is my wife's looking panicked. And she said, for God's sakes, don't answer your phone. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my wife has taken me out of the running. Uh, running that I was, I was never in, by the way. No, <laughs> trust me, nobody's called and, and I um, probably wouldn't encourage them to do it. And, and here's why, uh, which is, I, by the way, I think Kelly's right. I mean, he, uh, it, he, he may be apologizing with his phrase that I'm, I'm the chief of staff, not the chief of president. Um, but that's right, that, that is the job. And, but you can only actually be effective and, and serve as chief of staff if you have the confidence of the president. So, um, the, you know, the chief of staff job requires all of the, you know, all of the uh, most important characteristics of, of good public service, of, of which, by the way, I think Bill Burns is the gold standard. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, it, it also requires a, a relationship of trust with the president. And because the president has to, has to, you know, let the chief of staff uh, speak for him, uh, organize the operation, and the full supporter of uh, of Dennis's axiom there, um, and run a good process. That's that's what that's what you need a chief of staff for. You don't. As, as President Bush told me when he offered me the job, is a, I don't need a prime minister. He, by the way, he didn't need to say that, but <laughs> um, he did. And But he said to me, as President Obama probably said to you, uh, I do need a real chief of staff. And so you're in charge. I will back you up. And if you organize the staff the way you want it, you run the process the way you make you think it makes sense, and I will back you up, uh, and you will have my full support, you know, until you don't, and then, and then you're, <laughs> and then you're not chief of staff anymore. But, but while you're, while you're chief of staff, you have to be able to run the operation. So I, I got to structure the White House the way I thought was best. I hired and fired, um, uh, as uh, with the president's full support. In, including people with whom he was very close, um, and that's the kind of relationship you need to make make the place run. So I I hope that President Trump chooses somebody with uh, with experience and good judgment, but also someone whose experience and good judgment the the president will will trust and rely on, and that's that's been the challenge throughout the Trump administration. Well, you know, I think the ladies in the audience can appreciate what I call the sort of bad boyfriend scenario here, which is that it's probably unrealistic to expect a 71-year-old uh, man who has a very set in his ways patterns to, to change uh, at this point. And uh, if that's your uh, view of the relationship, right, you're, you're, you're headed for trouble. But I, I think both of you have actually, uh, in your answers, suggested, you know, something that gets us to the heart of our conversation today, which is... Uh, how much uh, of American policy, uh, you know, especially on areas of you know where foreign policy and trade policy uh, meets American politics, how much is that dependent upon the president himself, as opposed to uh, a good process or a more robust political consensus? I mean, you could argue that that one of the striking aspects of the last couple years has been the extent to which the president. Uh, has defined an agenda, uh, even one often at odds with uh, his own government as, as well as uh, uh, 
members of Congress, for example. You know, what can you tell us about uh, how much power uh, the person in the Oval Office has to shape a debate like the one that we're now having as a country about foreign policy and its history? I went first <laughs> last time. Okay. Um, uh, a lot. I mean, the, uh, the White House is where, is where all of this comes together. Um, and, and by the White House, I include the Office of Management and Budget, where, uh, where I also had the privilege of serving. Um, and uh, it really is the, uh, it is the President and the White House who, who need to make that calculation. Uh, and, and do that balancing as to where we're going to put our focus, where we're going to put our resources. Um, and more importantly, it's, it's the president who can really articulate for the public uh, what the stakes are, why, why what happens outside our borders matters so, so substantially to what happens inside. Now, it, it turns out that President Trump has actually, I, I think, tapped into that very effectively in, uh, in ways that, I, um, that Dennis and I probably both, in many respects, disagree with. Um, but he, he has recognized that uh, the, what, what's on the minds of a lot of Americans is, uh, is as usual, their own economic uh, security, um, but that economic security has been so substantially undermined in in the recent decades by what's going on outside the borders um, that he he has successfully brought the conversation together in a way that um, that I think is uh, may not be a bad thing for for the country and for our politics. You mean because it's causing us to have a conversation like this? Absolutely. Uh -huh. So, you know, in your current role at the Business Roundtable, you know, this is free trade has long been an orthodoxy, really, of the, the modern Republican Party. One question I, I ask every Republican uh, uh, that, I, that I encounter uh, who's, who's had experience in Washington last few years is, do you believe that, that the ascendancy of President Trump and, and, and Trumpism is uh, a fundamental rejection of that orthodoxy in the Republican Party, or is this uh, uh, some kind of an interlude or a kind of temporary situation? Um, I, 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 th I think a lot of the people with whom I served in government have comforted themselves with thinking that this is a, a, a Trump-focused interlude. Yes. I, I, I think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think Trump is a... Uh, is a symptom of what's going on in our politics rather than the cause of, of what's going on in our politics, and it, it will be with us for some time. Those of us who have been um, ardent supporters of an open international trading system, and I, I, I learned my religion at the feet of Ambassador Carla Hills, who's, who's with us here, who's, who um, served brilliantly as trade representative during Bush 41's term and successfully negotiated um, what used to be called NAFTA. Um, those of us who uh, those of us who come from that portion of the Republican Party are a shrinking minority. And it, it, is, it is not a, a quirk or a uh, a, a bizarre outgrowth of a of a reality TV star turned presidential candidate that both presidential candidates campaigned against the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and and basically uh, the one who won who is the one who was able to demonstrate that he was more against it than the other one. So I think it is a it is a a hopefully not a permanent feature of our politics, but a but a deeply embedded one, and um, it's it's incumbent on on those of us who believe in a in an open international trading system and organizations like this 
um, to undertake the kind of project build that you have here to understand what's going on in the, in the politics. And Bill, as you said, not try to preach the gospel of the Beltway to the uninitiated, but rather understand the interests of the uninitiated and try to make those consistent with an open international trading system. But I just want to press on this really quickly before I bring Dennis back in. Do you believe that it's some re-examination of the ideology is what's required, or that it's more of a question of reframing it uh, or broadening uh, the view of free trade to incorporate uh, the views of Ohio and what it means on the ground? In other words, is this, is this about changing the ideology of uh, the Republican Party on free trade, or is it about uh, understanding the American constituency for it better? It's, it's both, and I think it's, it's about evolving the ideology more effectively to, uh, to, to go beyond a rising tide lifts all boats and recognize that in, over the course of the last a uh, few decades, uh, a whole bunch of dinghies have been swamped, and um, and f that part of defending an open international trading system is making adjustments that um, that that make it possible for uh, f for those boats to be lifted as well. And um, I think that's I think that's the challenge of the study that. Uh, uh, that you all are undertaking and why, why I'm glad you're doing it this way because um, sticking with the silos ain't working. <laughs> so Janice, you're great at vote counting among your other uh, many skills. Uh, <coughs> is it possible in this kind of uh, political environment that, that Josh is talking about for uh, a rebranded NAFTA to pass on Capitol Hill uh, for uh, a resurrection, whether under President Trump or some future president of uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, President Obama kind of had, you know, the experience both ways uh, in yeah. a way. Yeah, so I'd, uh, I'd say a couple things. First, on Josh's point to your first question, I think it's absolutely right, and I think the, the president's ability to shape the public agenda is not only fundamentally quite strong. It's increasingly stronger the greater Congress demonstrates its dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So you see a migration of uh, institutional powers, many of them grounded in the Constitution, really flowing to the presidency over the course of the last uh, you know, 10, 20 years. Um, some of that's due to 9-11 and uh, what we've uh, addressed and confronted in that time period, but uh, increasingly it's a function of Congress uh, unable, unwilling to work together on big hard questions to pass them. And that too is a really good um, reason for the study that the task force and Salman um, have taken on, because there's got to be new inputs into the machine here to get a different output on the other end, and hopefully this is it. So that's one. Two is we, we had something very interesting on uh, the, when, when we were negotiating, the, when Ambassador Hill's uh, successor, Mike Froman, was negotiating the TPP, we went to get TPA, Trade Promotion Authority from Congress, which uh, is uh, part of the Beltway Gospel. Um, the point is, we pass that overwhelmingly with Republican votes, even though publicly available reporting at the time showed it dramatically underwater with Republican voters. We had, I think between two chambers, about 37 Democrats, even though publicly available polling of Democratic voters at the time had it well over 60% approval for President Obama getting that authority. So you could see very clearly some disconnect between the parties and their members in Washington and their voters at home. And whether that portends a big switch in orthodoxy for the parties, I doubt it. Uh, but it does bring to the fore uh, Josh's question, which is, uh, what is it about 
what we've always believed since World War II, that fundamentally an open trading system is in our interests. Uh, what did we miss, and how do we address that? I, you know, I have my views about this. this. isn't particularly new. You know, when it comes to labor market interventions, for example, wage support, child care, all, all sorts of different labor market interventions that governments around the world do to try to um, protect workers' uh, access. The United States routinely scores on the low end of economically developed, economically developed countries. So the extent to which we're pushing for a pretty disruptive economic system but not investing in programs and, and projects to mitigate the fallout of those, I think we get the worst of all worlds. And if we follow that trajectory into this next big economic change, namely more aggressive deployment of automation and importantly of artificial intelligence, then I think our politics will be completely upside down. And I, so I think, again, another reason for the important study. Last point, we were just talking about this upstairs. This, uh, the, the agreement formerly known as NAFTA, I say as a Minnesotan and a proud Prince fan, uh, <laughs> it seems like if there is a pathway to agreement, it's a pathway now well trodden in Washington, which is through massive crisis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the only way Washington does, pol does policy making now, mm -hmm. that is to say policy making that needs legislative action, that needs bipartisan support. And the president knows this, which is why he uh, threatened last week to withdraw the United States, putting us into this kind of uncharted territory. It'd be really interesting to hear what Ambassador Hill has to say about this. But this period post-withdrawal, this six-month uh, downdraft, is unanticipated and um, unprecedented and would induce the kind of crisis um, that uh, you, know, you could see an agreement coming out of or you could see an agreement not coming out of. And then all of a sudden the, the stakes are quite high. It's, it's a very it's like a mini brexit actually yeah. uh, you know there's no real process uh, for figuring out if we blow up the old NAFTA without getting a new one right I think that's a that that's the question and, and your confidence in this goes back to the first question about process protecting you if your confidence in the institutions and the processes to kind of pick up in a period of crisis is great then give it a shot if you're starting to worry about the durability of the institutions uh, that is a very high stakes gamble. And uh, I hope that the next chief, uh, along with Ambassador Bolton and uh, USTR Lighthizer. No, no relation, by the way. <laughs> spelled, There's a different, he's got an E. Spelled differently. Uh, so I, ho I hope they're mindful of that. Uh, well, let's. Let me pick up on this question of trade versus foreign policy, because yeah. I do think that uh, for many years we have treated uh, trade and international economics as a really separate discipline yeah. from foreign policy. And I think one of the head-snapping aspects of the Trump presidency is to uh, merge and converge those conversations uh, in a way uh, that they hadn't been uh, in the eight years of the Obama presidency, in the, in the Bush presidency. You know, we are thinking of uh, international relations in the world in the frame of have we entered a post-Cold War moment where counterterrorism and uh, sort of asymmetrical threats were uh, the things that we focused on even while the world was in economic crisis, uh, 2008 and beyond. Um, okay, so we've converged them at the top level of uh, presidential rhetoric and politics. Do either of you see uh, practical uh, consequences to our politics. I mean, you know, this is a town where structure and process dictate a lot of things. I don't see any uh, structural changes uh, that are merging those conversations, even though uh, for people they don't make a distinction between our China policy uh, uh, on security and uh, what it means for jobs in, in Ohio. Yeah. So are there structural changes that will are already happening as a result of President Trump's reorientation of our, our national conversation, uh, number one. Number two, 
uh, uh, is this just simply the breakup of an old order without uh, something new to replace it? I mean, anybody in the audience who's reading headlines this week says, my God, you know, Paris is burning and uh, the UK is uh, imploding and uh, the United States is uh, busy with yeah. what it's busy with. So. Yeah. So, uh, uh, I could go on. <laughs> <laughs> Could, could you so, repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm giving you an out by saying you can talk about whether we've had any structural yeah. uh, change. Yeah, to well, I'd say a couple things. One is I, this is one of the really powerful parts of the study, and, I, and I, I think we'll hear about this more, but trade is but one of many challenges facing uh, you know, the economy in Ohio. Uh, middle class families in Ohio and Minnesota. You know, I spent a lot of time both in 2016, 2015, early 2016, as steel was going kind of through the floor in the Iron Range in Minnesota, which provides uh, uh, iron ore that's key to steel production in this country. Um, so it's one piece of a much bigger, more complex puzzle. Structurally, Jim Steinberg, who was uh, our uh, one of Bill's colleagues and uh, one of our first uh, deputy secretaries of state in the Obama administration warned us of this when we were putting together the National Security Council. He said the creation of the National Economic Council in 1994, 1993, 1994 was very smart. Uh, you know, uh, Secretary Rubin put that together with President Clinton. He said, however, it's led to this fundamental bifurcation of the international economic question. Mm -hmm. So we tried to do two things uh, to address that. One is we created this position that Mike Froman uh, filled initially, which was he was Dep Deputy National Security Advisor who reported both to the National Economic Council Director. The National Security Council Director sat at all the same tables to try to integrate with his team, of which uh, Christopher was a member, uh, could then make sure that their analysis and their debate, uh, debating points were heard. One, two is we also had the National Economic Council Director, Jeff Zients at the end, in the uh, uh, Principals Committee in the National Security Council. The fact that that sounds as small to you as it does underscores the fact that the structural fixes are insufficient. And I'll come back one more time to China, which is right now, you see the national security geopoliticians doing this kind of uh, exercise where they're saying this choice towards collaboration, cooperation with the Chinese was a mistake. Yes. And it's time for us to relook that. Meanwhile, you have every major American multinational uh, corporation with major parts of its supply chain in China, and you have American tech firms right now worried about decoupling from China because that's where all the data is. That's where a lot of new interesting data science is. And if we do fully de decouple and go towards outright confrontation, they're going to miss opportunities to grow because China's going to beat us in artificial intelligence or they're going to beat us somewhere else. This is a fundamental challenge for the country that I hope the president has a team that is looking at questions on tariffs, questions on WTO, uh, questions on um, how you resolve uh, these questions that they've now threatened twice in the last <laughs> month on technology access in China and technology access in the United States, that there's a holistic team looking at this rather than just you know, the National Security Council or the US Trade Representative. Because if they're looking at that in this traditional silo that's been identified, then we're, it's a lose-lose for us. I'm, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with Dennis um, with a with a, a factual addendum, which is that the, the structure you described uh, in the White House of having a a, a joint uh, entity reporting both to the National Security Council and the National Economic Council. Uh, wasn't an Obama innovation. It was the Bolton. Uh, it wasn't even a, a Bush innovation. It was a Clinton innovation. Hmm. 
Um, but the, the, that role of Sherpa, which Dan Price sitting in the front row here so ably filled uh, during the, the Bush administration is a, is a, was for us a crucial role as it was yeah. for the Obama administration. And one of the things, things that I think have, that has gone wrong in the Trump administration is that it has not been a, uh, a respected and in crucial role in the way it ought to be in uh, in policy formulation. It's been, um, it seems like the policy has just sort of emerged much more from uh, the president's own instincts um, than from a, you know, a coherent process of the kind that um, Dennis McDonough always warns us will protect us. Um, the, but I, uh, I think we, I think we have to say at this point that, um, uh, the, this administration may in fact be getting something right about just what Dennis was saying about China in the sense that, um, our, our siloed perspectives on China, um, I think have, have, have led us to a, uh, a dangerous complacency about the, uh, the emerging role of China in the international economy. And now let me, let me put on my, not former chief of staff hat, but my current hat as, as head of the business roundtable, an organization of 200 CEOs of some of America's largest companies, almost all of them multinationals and almost all of them, as, as Dennis described, those, uh, those 200 companies, uh, actually with the exception of a couple of steel companies uh, who are in our membership, those 200 companies are mm -hmm. unanimous in, uh, in vigorous opposition to most of the strategy and tactics that the Trump administration has deployed on trade. And in particular with the imposition of, uh, of um, national security tariffs on steel and aluminum, in, the, in some of the negotiating objectives in, in the new NAFTA, in threatening a withdrawal from NAFTA, um, in punishing our friends and allies um, uh, for uh, just because, um, because trade is upsetting. Um, uh, all of those things are unanimously almost opposed by the 200 members of the BRT, who, who by the way, represent, um, I think it's, it's $7 trillion in annual sales and employ uh, over 15 million people here in the United States. So, it, this, this is a big collection of people across all industries. Um, but the place where they, where they go, uh, he has a point, is on China, where our expectations of convergence of China uh, to become more like us, to become a responsible participant in the international trading system, which is what prompted the Clinton administration to, uh, to negotiate their, uh, China's entry into the WTO, which is what prompted the Bush administration to push that across the finish line. Uh, those, those expectations of convergence have been uh, not just disappointed, but reversed over the course of the, uh, of the past decade. And the, the members of the Business Roundtable are the ones who feel that. Many of them are doing very well in China. They are making plenty of money. Um, they are getting, in some cases, reasonable access to the Chinese market. Their supply chains are interwoven and having a, a supply chain that's, that's both a NAFTA supply chain and a China supply chain makes it competitive to produce products here in the United States. So it's not a, it's not a terrible news story, but the combination of uh, intellectual property theft, forced technology transfer, limitations on foreign investment in China, 
and state subsidies to targeted industries, the, uh, each of those elements on its own would be a substantial problem. Taken together with the world's second, soon to be first largest economy, they, they are a systemic problem. And, uh, and, and a, it, it may take the kinds of um, what, to, what to our view is often erratic action by the president to get, um, to get Chinese attention and to get global attention to come together to, uh, to address the problem. Now, it's, it's, uh, it's a perilous moment in the world of national security and economic policy when uh, the world's two largest economies are in a confrontation like this, but um, better to have the confrontation now than 10 years from now when we may wish we had had it today. There's so much to unpack there. I, I, I want to bring in our audience in just a second. Uh, so I just quickly, both of you had a particular experience uh, in your roles that is very relevant to Washington today, which is you went uh, in the first few years of your presidency of having uh, control over Congress as well as the White House to a situation where after a midterm election there was divided government. That is, uh, I think, the earthquake whose tremors are being felt today in Washington in January is going to bring a different reality uh, into some of these fights, uh, whether it's uh, the rebranded NAFTA or the China conversation. Uh, you know, what, what do you predict are, you know, two or three things that will uh, happen uh, to the Trump presidency as a result of uh, this different power arrangement in Washington? Uh, will it affect any of these debates or not? Well, yeah, I think it will. Um, and, you know, there's basically uh, daily things that will get harder. There will be uh, obviously more investigations, more oversight. As a general matter, I think that's as, as uh, sparky as that gets and as um, um, nettlesome and meddling as the overseers are, I think that ultimately leads to better policy. Frankly, I think that's a, a constitutional requirement. I think in the main, it's a, uh, it's a good and clarifying and disciplining uh, function that will, I think, ultimately help the administration, although it won't, I guarantee you won't see it that way. Um, <laughs> That's uh, an interesting, I, I'd love to see you present that argument to <laughs> President Trump. Yeah. Um, it sounds like arguments don't get presented to President Trump. Um, <laughs> the, the second thing is, um, you know, the, it does now increase the um, need for things to get done in a bipartisan way. Right, so it just does open more surface area, uh, just on simple things like the annual appropriations process. Um, so they're going to have to get things done there, and that would be a place where um, ideally people will, having learned some lessons from 2016 about what's happening in the country, will you know start to make some headway. Um, the overhang on all of this, of course, is that since the midterm is over, the general is starting. And so while there'll be pressure on Congress to work together, there'll be pressure uh, on the president, or the president will surely see it in his interests to make sure that he's continuing to speak directly to his voters. And so uh, that's going to be a countervailing pressure no matter, uh, no matter what's happening on Capitol Hill. So um, query whether that ends up dominating uh, or whether Congress, informed by this uh, election they've just gone through sees it as in their interest to start getting some stuff done. So, uh, does it help President Trump? Possibly. That's that's in a way the scenario that's that's a possibility. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> in in two thousand six, when we uh, went briefly uh, into the minority in uh, both houses, I didn't I didn't feel like that was a big help. <laughs> Uh, but you know, in the uh, in the present circumstance, probably not a bad thing. Uh, and I'm speaking now uh, as a Republican, um, but but one who's who's deeply concerned about the about the functioning of our of our political system. 
probably not a bad thing to have um, uh, some uh, some evening of the of the uh, of the hands on the levers of power, and it may even turn out to be productive for the Trump administration that um, that things that could not be resolved with uh, with majorities in both houses, but not super majorities, and that. that um, that's often actually a the, the worst scenario for uh, for for gridlock is um, one party rule, but without the supermajority that actually makes it possible to govern. Um, that it may be possible to work out uh, destructive legislation on things like. Um, infrastructure or data privacy or immigration in ways that would not have been possible when one party views itself as the resistance. So I, uh, I'm, I, I don't, uh, I, I, I think the the Trump White House is in for a world of hurt um, in uh, with investigations from the House. Um, Hopefully, they'll be able to segment that and kind of, uh, we've, we've been talking about breaking down silos. Hopefully, they'll be able to silo that over here, as I hope the uh, Democratic leadership will be as well, uh, and try to be constructive in, in what may be a more productive political environment. I, I, I'd just say one last sentence on this, because I think the last thing Josh said is important, not the siloing, but I guess the penultimate thing he said, which is, I hear Speaker Pelosi saying things about trying to get work done in addition to making sure that they're overseeing Congress, quite different than the things that marked Senator McConnell's tenure uh, during the Obama administration, where he is now, it's obviously been widely reported and widely published that he just decided he wasn't going to do anything. And so um, that there's no evidence uh, that the incoming uh, Democratic majority has that view, and I think that's a good thing. By the way, it's also quite apparent where they won that their voters who elected them don't have that view. That is, they don't have a view that you should just hold out and you know stop everything that comes your way. So there should be some pressure towards getting some stuff done. This is what passes for optimism in Washington these days. Uh, <laughs> we can we can push them on that as an audience uh, before we leave. But I do want to bring in uh, our audience, and especially we, we have, I think, a real opportunity to marry these two conversations. Uh, Carnegie has done you know, a great thing today by bringing in some of the folks who helped to participate in this study uh, to be with us from Ohio and to sort of you know, reality test uh, some of this Washington conversation. So I'm going to go ahead and give the first question uh, to, to one of our visitors from Ohio, Ohio, Tiffany Swigert, who uh, I think, you know, let fire at these folks. Tiffany, come on. Uh, thank you. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity from Carnegie um, to quickly introduce you to my hometown, Coshocton, Ohio. Coshocton is located 75 miles northeast of Columbus, and it does sit directly between Columbus and Pittsburgh. Uh, this report does an excellent job of describing our past struggles regarding the loss of industry in Coshocton, Ohio. Um, I believe that too many times, though, it's difficult to see past the writing on the paper and truly look at the human impact um, that some of these decisions have. Um, I could easily detail the thousands of jobs that have been lost to foreign locations, as personally, we've experienced that with my father and my husband. However, I do believe it's more beneficial at this time to describe the absolute strength and resiliency that my community has had due to these struggles, thus making us the strongest of manufacturing workforce. Uh, due to the loss of one of our largest water consumers in Coshocton, they were a corrugated uh, paper company. Our residents experienced a 34% in increase on their water bills. Of course, this is all the while suffering from job loss and the increased cost of essential goods. Um, these companies are permitted to then pull out of our communities, leaving communities like ours with brownfield sites that we are left to clean up. And we're already strapped communities due to this loss. One would think that it would be easy enough to locate grant opportunities to redevelop those brownfields. However, local match dollars are always a requirement. 
Uh, we have been advised that if we have an end user for those sites, then we're much more competitive in that grant process. Thus, that kind of brings forth the chicken and the egg theory, um, as we would have a, an end <coughs> user there if the site was shovel ready. Um, I would prefer to highlight our current successes despite the struggle and certainly our hopes for future growth. As we put our best foot forward in Coshocton to redevelop those sites in an effort to attract new business opportunities with gainful employment, we would ask you to truly consider the best way to assist these communities in an actual rebound. By looking to provide funding for communities that are hit by those former trade policies in the form of site redevelopment dollars, um, even for speculative projects, um, as well as complete projects that were once started and stalled by the, certainly like the Columbus to Pittsburgh corridor. Um, with that situation, only 30% of the infrastructure needs to be completed to provide a continuous 160 uh, mile four lane highway directly from Columbus to Pittsburgh. Uh, the timing of this support is essential to a six county region and would certainly assist in the continued progression of the oil and gas boom. Uh, particularly with the downstream operations with the ethane cracker plants that are under construction in Pennsylvania and the proposed one in Ohio. With the completion of the Columbus to Pittsburgh corridor, a truly co critical piece of infrastructure for the entire region, we would expect increased traffic uh, that would provide support to additional business locations and subsequent job creation in that corridor. We have a proven track record of growing companies within our communities um, and we provide an outstanding return on investment. As the next seven, in the last seven years, $5 billion in private investment in a six county region has resulted in more than 9,500 jobs. We've done it before, and I'm confident that we'll do it again. But what advice can you give communities like ours that have experienced these tremendous losses and we're working hard to rebound, especially as we go after funding that would help with projects like these, but also keep our communities positive? That's a tough order. <laughs> Look, I think uh, Josh, men Josh mentioned three things that uh, might be able to get done in this Congress. Uh, immigration, data privacy, uh, privacy and data privacy, and then infrastructure. And I do think that you know, the, the infrastructure, in the statistics around infrastructure investment in the United States are really astounding. Um, and so it does seem to me that one, uh, one space where uh, your laydown intersects with uh, a stated common interest of the White House and of Republicans and Democrats is a new infrastructure bill. And that would be the place to address some of these questions like uh, the local match requirements. Um, that's one. Two is continuing to argue, um, as I think the paper does, for a broad take on the challenges facing uh, even a community like Coshocton that has been so profoundly impacted by trade and the international economic system. Uh, nevertheless, um, there are many other manifestations of potential opportunities uh, ra uh, rather than just uh, either uh, bringing back industries that have left, uh, or some other uh, trade-related argument. And then the third is uh, the how to keep communities positive and, and optimistic. I don't know, Mike, I guess my answer to that is I, I hope they're seeing more and more of you, because that sounded like a very optimistic case uh, to me. Um, and th that's what I'm struck by, too. Uh, kind of all around the country. This is what we've got, right? And it's done us pretty well. The people of this country have done us pretty well now for 240 some odd years. And there is a big debate right now in the international system about whether the West maybe has kind of run its game. Paris is in flames, Brexit, you know, Susan re referenced it. Meanwhile, the Chinese feel pretty good, right? Uh, and they're making the case that, well, you know, we don't have a Congress that we have to worry about. We make decisions, we get it done. I, I don't understand the crisis of confidence generally in the West. I think we've seen periods like this. 1968 in Europe looked a lot worse than the Yellow Jackets today, right? Even the debates in the 1980s about nuclear deployments. Um, that's because uh, there is a fundamental 
I believe this is kind of uh, out of vogue to make this argument, but there's a fundamental strength in an open, democratic, transparent society that invests in its people, that doesn't actually just you know use its people as part of the system. And the extent to which our politics begins to reflect that again is, is I think, the best course for optimism. So the road that runs through it is an actual road. <laughs> <laughs> Can you build her road? Uh, Get your business roundtable people to uh, build this road. Uh, first, I'm in to what Dennis said. Second, um, the uh, when I when I first arrived at the business roundtable, I you know I wondered what you know what issues do these uh, titans of industry care about and. So I, I set about asking a lot of them. I asked the staff, you know, what are the what's at the top of the list, um, and it turns out that it's it's not really at the top. The there's an issue that's not really at the very top of anybody's public policy list, um, but it's always in the top three is workforce and skills training. Um, we uh, we now have um, basically I think it's now seven million unfilled jobs in the United States. You know we got our unemployment rate is down to three point seven percent. We've got seven million unfilled jobs. We also have about seven million unemployed people. Um, does that tell you something that uh, that there's a there's a mismatch going on? And then anecdotally, if you take it to each of our companies, uh, they will all tell you that they, uh, most of them, um, have trouble finding the properly trained workers to fill the, the jobs that they have. They're, uh, they're, they're feeling pretty good economically. They're feeling good about the US economy. Generally, let's put trade aside for a moment, which is a, which is a big headwind. Um, but the the businesses in my organization have have good economic tailwinds behind them in the form of of less regulatory anxiety and most and most importantly, a reduced corporate tax rate. Uh, and so they are ready to invest. They're they're ready to hire people, um, and then they have trouble finding the people that they need. And uh, I think the most, the most important and hopeful thing that, uh, that public policy can accomplish at the federal, state, and local level is to reorient our, our system of skills training in this country toward educating people um, either at the beginning of their careers or in the middle of their careers for the jobs that we actually have available. Um, the, the kinds of jobs that our new economy will produce um, are, uh, are, are not necessarily the comfortable manufacturing 40-year career jobs of, of the last century. As hard as the Trump administration may try, that toothpaste is not going to go back in the tube. The, the global economy has changed, and we cannot insulate ourselves from it. But what we need to do is um, reorient our education system, um, perhaps away from four-year college degrees, um, toward more technical training, the traditional four-year college degree, toward more technical training, and do it in partnerships with, uh, with uh, government, with academia, and with the businesses who are best positioned to say, here are the skills credentials we need. And that's, that's something we're working hard at at the Business Roundtable. We've got uh, so far, 11 regions around the country where we've, we've got a CEO leading um, the local community to, uh, to bring together the, the government dollars that are available to bring in the community colleges, the local universities, and then have the business people say, 
here's what I, here's the kind of de training I need, here's the kind of degree I need, and I will take a hundred apprentices who will be, who will be on a program of, uh, while they're studying of, of working for my business, uh, and they'll get the skills they need. And because that, that is how the economy of the future is going to work. Um, and it's not just going to work, it's not going to be just at the front end of your career, it's going to be in the middle, because you're going to have to do it again, because the, uh, the life cycle of uh, expertise that's required in the new economy, I think, is um, the, the time frame is just going to be shortening. So um, maybe we'll find a CEO in your region who wants to, wants to take on, on the partnership. But um, there are a lot of big corporations in this company who are looking for places to locate their facilities where they can get the sober, um, well-trained, um, and uh, enthusiastic workforce that they want to do in the United States because the biggest thing that's happened economically over the course of the Trump administration is the tax reform, which now makes it uh, a, it, which removes the penalty for doing business in the United States, which is where all 200 of our CEOs would rather do their business. Well, I think that's a great uh, pivot point to Dave Claiborne, who is also one of our visitors from Ohio and uh, from Marion, Ohio, where you're uh, working now with a, a university uh, as it considers its role in kind of the redevelopment of community. But, but it goes to the question, what are the jobs? I think both of you are addressing that. Uh, this report has a striking fact uh, to me that really leapt out. The number one employer in Ohio, as it is in 21 other states around the country, is Walmart. Is Walmart. Correct. That was a, a shocking. Uh, yeah. Statistic. Basically, half of the country. So yes, I'm from Marion, Ohio. I, I should say I should preface this by saying I grew up here in the east, just a little north of here in Baltimore. So I went to Ohio uh, for an education and uh, remained a loyal Orioles and crab cake fan. So um, <laughs> I get back here every now and then. But it 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 it, it helped inform. I sort of brought that East Coast mentality. Uh, uh, to the Midwest and, and stayed in Ohio because I really fell in love with, uh, and you're from Minnesota, that, that sort of Midwest ethic. Or yeah. It's a different feel. It's a the accent is a, nice, too. It, it is, too. <laughs> it's a, it, it, I think there's a real um, a valuable commodity that exists in, in the Midwest, which is that, that sort of can-do spirit workforce. I, I called it... Uh, sort of a humbleness uh, coupled with confidence, but they won't tell you that they're confident. It's, it's, a, it's a different feel. Uh, but I think it's a valuable thing, and it's, a valuable, it's valuable for our democracy. So uh, it, you know, to the degree we can preserve that, not simply empty out this great swath of the middle of the country and move everybody to the coasts, uh, here, here. I, I think we need to preserve that. So I put that pitch in. A little bit about Marion, Ohio. I, I went to work there as a, the economic development director back in 97. Uh, at, at that point, where what you were describing, Josh, the, um, the 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 old line industries, the the forty year careers, uh, those companies had gone away or, or were in the process. As I got there in ninety seven, <coughs> Marion Power Shovel was the big gun in town. They employed twenty five hundred people making huge equipment for for mining. In fact, they made the uh, the NASA crawlers that still carry the rockets out to the cool. out to the launch pad down at Cape Canaveral. Um, so they were they were very talented people and, and worked well, but that company had just uh, the final period on the sentence uh, was written when I got there. The final parts warehouse uh, moved to Milwaukee as the company was was uh, sold to uh, Bucyrus International, and it was all moved to Milwaukee. Um, so there were other big companies, but basically half of the industrial workforce, Marion, uh, through that contraction, had gone away um, in, in the eighties and and. 90s. So I looked at my job as sort of an existential exercise. Uh, how do you how do you save this community? What what's next? You know, after these guys have gone away, what preserves this this place that has this you know this valuable commodity, this sort of Midwest sense of community? Um, so we we created an industrial park that took advantage of some of the uh, infrastructure that was already there. We have a lot of rail. We developed a dual rail industrial park that 
has access to competing rail. Uh, we got four quick companies in there, and they've all expanded two or three times now. Uh, a couple of Honda suppliers, uh, a small Japanese company, and uh, a welded steel tubing <coughs> uh, plant. And there were a number of other projects that ha really kind of cushioned us uh, uh, and, and you know, refilled some of those, those jobs into the community. Um, so that's a, the quick history of Marion. But um, my question is, a, a lot of the new investment that's come has been foreign direct investment. In that, in that park that I mentioned, uh, all four of the projects that are in there are either directly foreign they're, uh, or related to uh, a foreign direct investment. There are two Honda suppliers, so they're relying on, on Honda. One of them is Japanese owned. There's a Japanese company, and now the, the, the tube mill that was LTV is now ArcelorMittal. Uh, out of Luxembourg. So our economy is pretty dependent on foreign investment. Uh, I guess my question is, as uh, you know, as we try to get the attention of China and the, these tariffs that are coming on, the, the steel tariffs, et cetera, uh, they cut both ways, even, even in the microcosm of Marion, Ohio. Um, Nucor Steel probably likes that steel tariff. They're, you know, their, their price of their raw material, their, their, of what they're selling is up. Uh, Whirlpool, who's our, now our biggest employer, isn't so happy about it. They make uh, 20,000 dryers a day out of rolled steel that's costing them a whole lot more. And Honda's not so happy about that because their inputs are, are higher. So it, it cuts both ways. As, so as we, as we try to get the attention of China and, and, and bludgeon these countries with, with tariffs, uh, are we going to mess up our foreign direct investment, which we're dependent on too are you know can is there a is there a balancing act is there some finesse that can be used to to get their attention on one hand but continue the, the FDI on the other or is finesse not a word that's that, that works anymore in Washington yeah well uh <laughs> Uh, by the way, I have never been in an event where the word finesse is a laugh line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. F uh, and finesse is not Donald Trump's middle name, exactly. Uh, it, it, it's a very good question, and and some and and you brought up a lot of good factors about what's going on. I, I mean, I love the Whirlpool example. Whirlpool is the beneficiary of trade protection. From uh, from the Trump administration, on uh, they put, you know, they put trade restraints on imported washers and dryers, um, which should have boosted Whirlpool's business a bit. Um, but you know, it's a little bit like you know, uh, sawing off the legs of a stool. So you sawed off part of the leg of the stool. Okay, so Whirlpool's a little better off. Um, but then they uh, then they put uh, restraints on steel and aluminum. And so what happens? Uh, Whirlpool's costs go up. And, and guess who's more competitive now is imported washers and dryers. So you, you're kinda, you kind of got to saw that leg. Uh, and if you keep sawing, evident, eventually you're sitting on the ground. You're, you're no longer on, a, uh, you're no longer on a, a, a solid chair where you need to be. Foreign direct investment is, is critical in all of this to the to the US economy that's part of what uh, the toothpaste that's not going back in the tube that so many communities depend on the Toyotas and the Hondas and so on uh, that are providing really good jobs in the community and uh, in many cases are among America's best exporters are are the uh, the companies with foreign investment? So uh, it, this administration has been bad at the finesse game, um, to say the least. Um, but uh, it it seems to me not impossible that they and or a successor administration can arrive at a place where we are. Uh, we are restoring ourselves to the leadership role in an open international trading system while confronting the Chinese on, uh, on the policies that themselves are threatening that system. And the, the first place to start would be 
take off the steel and aluminum tariffs from our friends and allies, which by the way will result in the, um, uh, in the removal of the retaliatory tariffs against whatever, pro whatever products we're trying to export from the, from the Marion area, um, get together with those friends and allies and, and put pressure on the Chinese on the problems that are really affecting the U.S. economy. I'd, I'll say one other thing here, which is that um, I, uh, I mean, these, your communities are probably really good examples um, of, of, the, of the American spirit um, of, uh, of competition, of, of fairness. And, and I think that's what's been lost in, in a lot of the, uh, in, in, if, if you look at what people actually say and they say in focus groups and so on, it's a sense of the loss of fairness in the system. That if, if you lose a competitive race, um, it, you know, that's been the American way. Um, we permit bankruptcy here. And we, we almost celebrate bankruptcy here in, in, in some respects and in ways that other countries do not. Um, if you lose fair and square, but there's, a, there's been a loss in the sense of fairness in the system, and I think um, to the extent that whatever the Trump administration has, has started can actually be rooted much more in, in the rule of law and in fairness, um, we've got a shot at restoring U.S. leadership in the world that has been so badly undermined, number one. And number two, restoring some confidence in the American people in, in their government to serve their interests. Dennis, I'm going to give you a last word. I'm afraid we've uh, kind of run to the end of our time, but uh... look, I, I I agree with you on the Midwest. Uh, one, uh, two is Josh, Josh. Josh's last point, I think, is an extraordinarily important one, and I guess I urge the task force as you're thinking about uh, how you look at broadening understanding for foreign policy, national security maker policy makers about economic impacts. You also have some humility about why the system we have grew up the way it did. So we also put a lot of tariffs on steel during the course of 2016. And in fact, steel had rebounded quite profoundly uh, by the end of 2016. But how we did it was important using the institutions that we had built up since World War II, the International Trade Commission, which is designed to look at and study tariffs and dump, uh, dumping and uh, trade patterns from other countries to empower us to be able to use this fairness doctrine against our competitors uh, and protect our own people. I think that's really important. The extent to which the president has now used the national security national security exemption makes it really hard to argue when we're arguing national security against Canada. It makes it very difficult for us to argue that that's based on fairness or rule of law. Um, it starts to feel like it's based on something else. And so then when others in the system use that against us, we're weakened in our ability to, to rebut them. And so that's the rub, I think, is what is it about the existing system that worked and worked well? What is it about the existing system that did not work well? And we've just heard several examples of same. And then ultimately, what are the things that we could do that we chose not to or that we underinvested? Um, Josh, Josh talk, talked about uh, tax policy. I have a different view uh, on the tax bill or the tax law. Um, but I sure think other things like, I bet you it was a lot more affordable for you to go from Baltimore to Ohio uh, when you went in probably like the early 90s um, than it is today, which means there's a lot fewer students, unless they're students of means, going from Baltimore to Ohio. And that's, that's a shame. 
And so we have to get back to those kinds of interventions too. Um, so uh, I'm really glad to have been here and I'm really glad to have met you guys and have been able to read your all's works. I'm so sorry that we've run out of time because I imagine that most of us uh, could sit here all day and uh, get your advice. We haven't even asked you uh, some of the big questions. Uh, so uh, it, I think we can reconvene. Bill, yes? <laughs> we'll bring them back uh, for another conversation uh, because I imagine uh, there will soon be much more to digest as the, the reality show turns on. But meanwhile, yeah. I want to thank uh, especially uh, you for coming and giving us uh, a real reality check to a conversation that we have here in Washington uh, all the time. And also thank both of our chiefs of staff for giving us a little bit of optimism uh, at a moment when uh, it can seem like the world is burning. And thank our moderator who did an excellent job. Thanks, Susan.